Well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Albert Rice. I noticed the date on the bottom of my presentation is off. I apologize for that. But uh, today we'll be talking about the uh, history of nuclear propulsion. So, uh, next slide. So uh, the objectives today, uh, you know, how how is nuclear propulsion born? Yeah, what what are the incentives of nuclear propulsion? Uh, what vessels have had nuclear propulsion, and then uh, what what what's the future of the industry as a whole? So uh, I've been lucky to be part of uh, Fermi Energia for about a month and a half now. Uh, this is our founders team, a group of amazing individuals that I've had the opportunity to work with, and it's just been. Uh, a very, very exciting start to be part of such an amazing project, uh, bringing the future development of SMRs in Estonia. Uh, this is the, my office team, the team that I get to interact with on a daily basis. And by interact with, I mean, I get to tell them all of my corny American jokes and they, they're nice to me and smile and nod and uh, laugh at my terrible dad jokes. <clears throat> Um, but yeah, it's been an amazing, amazing time to work, uh, working with each and every one of these individuals. So today, a little bit about myself. Uh, I was a nuclear machinist mate in the United States Navy for about 11 and a half years. Um, I was, uh, which basically means I was a mechanic in the uh, engine room of a nuclear power plant. And uh, my specific title uh, was lead engineering laboratory technician, which meant that I was in charge of all the chemistry uh, for the primary and secondary plant and the radiological controls uh, with regards to uh, the nuclear power plant. Um, so radiological controls, I mean, like if you watch the movies and you see the guys in the yellow anti-contamination clothing suits with uh, little electric counters, they go click, 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 click all the time, a uh, Geiger Mule counter. Uh, that was me. Uh, we, uh, we call those chicken suits. I love putting on the chicken suit and running around and uh, doing all that. Obviously, uh, all for practice, never, never for uh, an actual disaster. So thankfully, uh, over my years, I was stationed in Pearl Harbor and Hawaii on the USS Bremerton. Um, I spent most of my time at sea on the USS Bremerton and got to do a little stint on the USS Seawolf. One of my uh, fellow lead ELTs on the Seawolf <clears throat> was uh, expecting a child. So uh, I got voluntold to uh, go out to sea on the USS Seawolf so he could be there. But I actually knew the guy, he's a pretty good friend, so I was happy to do it. But it was exciting to go out on the USS Seawolf, got to see a different plant, different platform. Uh, got to do some cool stuff that I never got to do on the USS Bremerton because uh, the uh, Bremerton was old. She was cool, I think was late in 1979 or she was commissioned in 79, but either way, uh, definitely older than me. And uh, it was a pretty old boat. So being on the USS Seawolf was, uh, really, really interesting. Uh, after that, we uh, de I decommissioned the USS Bremerton in uh, Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in Bremerton, Washington, and I almost got to decom the Jacksonville. Uh, got her pretty much right up to entering dry dock before I uh, separated from the Navy. So yeah. After the Navy, I uh, decided that I was going to start working on joining the Seven Continent Club. So uh, I had just recently moved to Estonia and I uh, got an amazing opportunity to work down in uh, Antarctica. And I got out of the Navy so I could spend more time with the, the family. And then the first thing I do when I get out is uh, take a job that takes me away for another seven months on the opposite side of the world. But it was an amazing opportunity. Uh, I got to uh, do the power, I was the power water and wastewater plant supervisor at McMurdo Station uh, on Ross Island in Antarctica. We had a 7.1 megawatt diesel plant uh, 200,000 gallon freshwater plants, and then a four train, no correction, three train uh, um, wastewater plant. So it's uh, pretty amazing. And then this is my team uh, gathered around the McMurdo station sign, a uh, great group of individuals that I got the awesome opportunities to lead. And uh, then obviously the picture, the obligatory picture of me in my big red parka, which is very, uh, uh, it's a staple of um, the United States Antarctic program. Uh, and then uh, standing on the runway of the C-17 uh, in the background. That's uh, what that was the day I was leaving. So pretty pretty excited to get on that plane after <laughs> several months down on the ice. But yeah. Um, and of course, I can't say that I've been to Antarctica or showing pictures without showing a few pictures of penguins. So 
Right here we have some Adeles, uh, not the less famous cousin of the Emperor Penguin, but uh, they're pretty cool, very inquisitive uh, little creatures, uh, very interesting, very adorable, obviously, as all penguins are, and they were very curious wandering around the town. Um, they would uh, kind of get just wander everywhere. If I had to like relate them to a normal uh, animal that I think more mo most people could re uh, relate to, I would say they were about on par with a chicken. So that same like in uh, intelligence and manneristics or mannerisms, characteristics, blah, but yeah. <clears throat> All right, so diving right in. So following the destructive display of the power of the atom in both Nagasaki and Hiroshima, uh, the world was on edge. Uh, you know, would this new invention of man be his undoing? Uh, many countries understood that there was power to be harnessed from the atom just prior to World War II and petitioned their governments to support research into nuclear fission for nuclear weapon development. And uh, rightly so, the birth of the atomic age <clears throat> in the eyes of the general public has had a negative stigma attached to it. Uh, it would take Dwight D. Eisenhower, uh, President Eisenhower, to stand before the UN General Council to expose on a grand scale the power of the atom and its potential in unlocking cheap, near limitless energy for all mankind. Uh, the efforts were not as fruitful as Eisenhower may have hoped and was eventually relegated to nothing more than Cold War propaganda to entice countries to forego the pursuit of nuclear weapons to obtain power production. And, you know, honestly, isn't that a pretty good idea anyway? I mean, I think every reasonable person would agree that less nuclear weapons in existence, the better. Um, so this is a commemorative stamp, uh, which has a quick quote from uh, President Eisenhower's address. And I was just wanting to read this, this one part that I, at the end of this quote that I really like. Um, to devote its entire heart and mind to find the way by which the miraculous inventiveness of man shall not be dedicated to his death, but consecrated to his life. And I think that's a uh, pretty good summation of the promise of nuclear power. So um, having found this new energy source, governments and organizations were clamoring to find practical applications that would give them a competitive edge. So out of the woodworks, several ideas ranging from practical and reasonable to downright crazy were pitched. Um, here's a, the a concept of a nuclear powered uh, aircraft. This is a cutaway drawing of a proposed nuclear powered aircraft by the United States Air Force. And uh, through nuclear powered jet engines, uh, I said, though, sorry, though nuclear powered jet engines were designed in a plane with a nuclear reactor built and flown, uh, the project was eventually abandoned. Uh, many think that it was the shielding aspect of the aircraft that was never solved which ultimately led to the demise of the nuclear powered plane, but that is not the case. And even I thought that up until performing a lot of this research. Um, the NB-36H aircraft built by Convair in conjunction with the United States Air Force logged 215 hours of flight time with 89 hours of reactor plant operations, albeit not used for propulsion purposes, uh, to, just to perform uh, reactor shielding studies. It was eventually determined that the shielding was sufficient to protect the crew but that the risks of radioactive contamination from an accident far outweighed its strategic usefulness. And by accident, I don't mean a nuclear accident, I mean the plane crashing, because <clears throat> um, they, they tend to do that from time to time. And uh, the, the fallout would, uh, the spread of contamination would be non, not ideal. So much like its uh, winged aerial brother, there was a push to put nuclear reactors in airships or zeppelins. Uh, in 1954, there was a feasibility study performed. In 1957, the book The Zeppelin and the Atomic Age was published to champion the resurrection of these large airships with nuclear-powered, uh, electrically driven uh, airships. And in 1959, Goodyear presented a plan for nuclear-powered airships for both military and civilian use. But again, like its winged aerial brother, uh, the prospect of radioactive contamination in conjunction with an already heavily stained track record of mishaps uh, the giant airships remain grounded, nuclear powered or not. They were relics of a bygone age. Um, the uh, image on the lower left is that of the uh, Hindenburg disaster, uh, very uh, prevalent in the public's mind at the time of all of this being pitched. And the right is just a, an old US Navy airship, which 
Um, I think this is back in the days before the U.S. Air Force existed, albeit uh, still to this day, I think uh, Navy has more planes than the Air Force, but it's not a competition. Go Navy. <laughs> um, and then <clears throat> enter Admiral Rickover, a man with a plan. So Admiral Rickover is known as the father of the nuclear Navy, and for good reason. Uh, coming from humble beginnings, he immigrated to the United States at the age of six with his family, fleeing the rise of anti-Semitic sentiment in Poland, and grew up in a Jewish neighborhood of Chicago. In June of 1922, Rickover graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy and was commissioned as an ensign. He would go on to serve in the uh, surface fleet of the Navy and earn a Master of Science from Columbia University through the next two decades. Uh, rising through the ranks, Rickover made a name for himself as a demanding leader. The Time Magazine described a, quote, sharp-tongued Hyman G. Rickover, or Hyman Rickover that spurned his men to exhaustion, spurred his men to exhaustion, ripped through red tape, drove contractors into rages. He went on making enemies, but by the end of the war, he had won the rank of captain. He had also won the reputation as a man who gets things done, end quote. Uh, in 1951, he was assigned to work with General Electric to develop a nuclear propulsion plant for destroyers. Rickover quickly realized the potential of nuclear marine propulsion and was the main driving force to push the Navy in the direction of nuclear powered submarines. He would go on <clears throat> to become the head of naval reactors and develop the USS Nautilus. <clears throat> so right here uh, is kind of like a little simplified drawing of a nuclear propulsion plant. Um, all of this was pulled from Wikipedia, so there's nothing uh, confidential or anything in here. So we'll just uh, go through uh, cycle one and cycle two. So cycle one would be your reactor compartment side, your primary system, and then cycle two is your secondary plant or propulsion system. And this is a pressurized water reactor and secondary loop that is typical of most mar maritime propulsion applications. So starting in the lower left-hand corner of the uh, reactor plant, you'll see the little, the reactor, the red and yellow <clears throat> square or I box in the corner. Uh, we used to make the joke on the boat that uh, hot rock makes boat go. That's how we'd explain to the non-nuclear rates how uh, nuclear power worked. So basically, and there's a lot of truth to that, you know, the fuel would heat up um, in part, uh, heat up the water in the reactor. That water would then go to the steam generator, the uh, half blue, half red um, egg-shaped thing on the top right corner of the uh, primary side. And it would transfer heat from the reactor coolant through a series, uh, through a heat exchanger, through uh, non-direct contact, but through metal <clears throat> to the secondary plant, the secondary water. That water would then heat up and become steam. Uh, the water leaving would, uh, the primary or the steam drain from the primary side would be cooled slightly. We call it cold leg, but it's a relativistic term. It's not cold at all. It's still really hot but it goes back to the core to cool the core and be uh, reheated and can continue the cycle. Um, the yellow and red uh, kind of pill-shaped object up in the top left is the pressurizer. It's not really labeled in this drawing, but it, uh, that's what basically what maintains uh, the core covered at all times and maintains the pressure of the primary plant. So as a, in the steam generator, as uh, the water is boiled and becomes steam, it goes through a series of moisture separators to get dry steam, goes through the red piping that you see here through the wall and then uh, through the main steam system <clears throat> of the plant. Uh, we use the steam to spin uh, turbines, uh, steam turbines that are connected to either a uh, turbine generator or a propulsion turbine. <clears throat> the propulsion turbine uh, spins, connects to a series of gears, obviously, uh, lower the uh, revolutions to something that would be useful to a shaft. And then uh, it spins the shaft, which has the propeller connected to the back. Um, and whenever you spin the shaft, obviously you spin the propeller and uh, that provides propulsion to the submarine. Uh, after the steam goes through the steam turbines, uh, it goes through, uh, goes to a condenser. Uh, it is cooled uh, in this case by seawater, not again, uh, through, not direct contact, but through a heat exchanger. And then uh, it's the steam is condensed into uh, a liquid condensate. And then that condensate is then pumped back to the steam generator to start the process anew. So um, pretty, pretty easy in theory. And this is actually like uh, how, I mean, nuclear power plants work. Uh, you create steam, 
you spin a steam turbine and uh, depending on what that steam turbine is connected to, yeah, be it a uh, generator or um, a propeller, it can provide uh, propulsion or electricity. <clears throat> and speaking of electricity, we'll get into that. So electrical power production, uh, it's pretty easy. It's uh, generator action as easy as one, two, three. All you need is a magnetic field, a current carrying conductor and relative motion between the two. So the electrical current running through a conductor or wire will generate a magnetic field around the conductor. Uh, passing a conductor through a magnetic field will generate voltage in the conductor. And then a generator action requires, uh, like I said, all those three things. And um, in this case, the conductor is called the armature winding, a stationary ring of coils that sits around the rotor. And the magnetic field is from the rotor windings, which, will, uh, which we build by passing current through the rotor. And then the relative motion between the two uh, is from the steam turbine, uh, which spins the rotor at the desired uh, revolutions per minute, which changes based on uh, frequency and poles. Uh, simplified version, uh, uh, simplified version of AC production. <clears throat> um, as you have your poles spinning through the uh, armature windings, as in this scenario, you'll see uh, the north is coming up on. Uh, Bravo prime, so your Bravo prime voltage is that green line, is nearing its uh, uh, negative max value, <clears throat> and uh, the uh, south pole had just passed the Charlie uh, prime windings, and it is, uh, since it's the prime side, it is the um, uh, max voltage shown by that blue line. It's just now coming down from its max voltage. So as this uh, rotor spins through, it will um, have the same, similar in, interactions with every single one of these armature windings until it goes through all three. And uh, we call one cycle 1 60th of a second, um, which was would be true for uh, 60 hertz, three phase AC, but uh, the most common application in Europe is 50 hertz. So it would just be slowed down a little bit. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, generating three phase AC, pretty simple, right? Um, but yeah, back to submarines. So on January 17th, 1955, the USS Nautilus made the famous statement over the radio underway on nuclear power. And the face of maritime propulsion would never be the same. On the 10th of May, she headed south for a shakedown, which is a uh, <clears throat> kind of like a, you know, getting out the kinks, uh, testing out the systems, getting, getting the rust off and uh, kind of getting everybody used to the boat. Uh, she was submerged throughout as she traveled uh, 1,100 nautical miles or 2,000 kilometers for you metric type from New London, Connecticut to San Juan, Puerto Rico and covered 1,200 nautical miles in less than 90 hours. At the time, this was the longest submerged cruise by a submarine and the highest sustained speed for at least one hour ever recorded. In August of 1958, she became the first submarine to complete a submerged transit of the North Pole and she became the first watercraft vessel to reach the geographic North Pole, all while transitioning or transiting from the Bering Strait to Greenland. This was the first testament to the benefits of that nuclear propulsion offered, extended periods submerged, continuous high-speed operations, and a near infinite range. Uh, since the last sailboat was pushed out of service in favor of steamships, vessels have had their range limited by their ability to carry fuel. As a former sailor, I must admit that that doesn't sound so bad. Uh, the more poor calls is, I mean, more poor calls is always a good thing. I mean, the more, the better. But from a tactical standpoint, uh, from a strategic standpoint, this is a serious limitation. With the dawn of nuclear power propulsion, nuclear vessels were limited only by the amount of food they could carry uh, to feed their crew and the crew's willingness to stay out to sea, which was not always the highest. <laughs> but yeah, as a former submariner, I can tell you, uh, sometimes or better than others. But uh, yeah, so pictured here is the USS New York, um, uh, New York City performing an emergency blow. So this is probably one of the, like the most romantic images that you can see from the, uh, from the submarine fleet, um, this emergency blow maneuver. So to perform this maneuver, we, uh, the main ballast tanks are filled with pressurized air to evacuate water, making the submarine more buoyant and propelling it to the surface. Uh, this is a safety feature that can surface the boat in an emergency to prevent sinking. And uh, a large up angle is achieved that can feel a bit odd as the floor moves underneath you. And a moment of weightness, weightlessness can be felt in the forward part of the boat as it reaches its uh, peak. 
before it starts falling back down into the ocean. I was fortunate to experience several of these uh, EMBT blows over my career, uh, all for training, obviously. And I can tell you that it was uh, it was amazing every single time. I remember uh, my first underway, we had just gotten out of a shipyard period. And we part of a recertification from a shipyard period where you do a lot of maintenance and overhauling is uh, uh, an EMBT blow. And I everybody on the boat was super excited um, from the people that had just reported with me to, you know, the Cobb, which is the chief of the boat and the captain, which is the senior officer. So Cobb is a senior enlisted captain, senior officer. And everybody, every single person was excited because it really is. It, every single time I, I, you do it, it's a lot of fun. Um, you kind of feel like Michael Jackson in uh, Thriller, like leaning forward as the uh, as the floor comes up against you. You you feel like you're standing straight, but you're leaning at like a 30 degree angle. It's it's kind of crazy, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting. And on the uh, I think one of my last uh, stints underway on the USS Bremerton, we performed uh, another EMBT blow just one last time for fun before pulling into. Uh, um, Bremerton uh, for decommissioning. And it was just as exciting that time as it was the first time five years prior. So it was a pretty cool maneuver. Um, so over the course of the U.S. Navy nuclear propulsion program, there have been more than 80 nuclear powered vessels, over 5,700 reactor years of safe operations, and over 134 million miles steamed on nuclear power, and 150 ports visited in over 50 countries. The key to this flexibility and in pulling into ports all over the world is the near perfect safety record, uh, or no, is the perfect safety record. Uh, most people would never know that there is a nuclear powered vessel pulling into a nearby port because that track record of safety has made it so mundane. It's, it's the same as a small sailboat pulling into the harbor. And it's really just a testament of the Navy's commitment to excellence and their prioritization of safety over uh, all else. And um, yeah, it's kind of, it's just been weaved into the DNA of uh, the nuclear Navy. Um, to promote the success of nuclear submarines, there have been efforts to garner public attention through uh, live submarine races, uh, like the one pictured here. But for some reason, it never really took off. And as a submariner, I, I'm kind of offended. I mean, I don't know why, this is, this is exciting. <laughs> joking, of course. Um, on April 10th, uh, so with, with uh, nuclear uh, power submarines, uh, they're obviously one of the reasons that the nuclear airplane and the nuclear blimps were um, passed over was because of the potential for accident and uh, the spread of contamination to the environment. So some people ask me a lot, like, well, what happens if a nuclear submarine sinks? And um, unfortunately, uh, that has happened twice. And, uh, and it's important to talk about because, I mean, they're, they're, I understand they're the concern. Uh, so I thought I would just uh, bring, have, spend a few minutes on, it, on this, on the Scorpion and the Thresher. So on April 10th of 1963, the Thresher sunk during a deep diving test of about, at about 350 kil uh, kilometers east of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, killing all 129 crew and shipyard personnel aboard. There's still some debate on the actual initiating event uh, leading to the sinking of the Thresher, but at 0918 AM, the USS Skylark, who was out there with her during her uh, deep diving test, uh, detected a high energy, low frequency noise characteristic of an implosion. The loss of the Thresher launched the SubSafe program, which is a quality assurance program designed to prevent any flaws of safety of ship systems from causing a complete loss of ship. Uh, the only other U.S. Navy nuclear-powered submarine lost at sea was the USS Scorpion. Uh, the, it was not yet subsafe certified and required updates to her torpedo batteries that was delayed until after the end of deployment, which some people point to as the reason for her sinking, but she failed to report to her home port on May 27th of 1968. A full search was launched to find the USS Scorpion, uh, a search that would continue for months uh, until she was actually finally found on October of 1968. She sank with all hands on board with no official reason uh, listed for her sinking. Um, annual reports on both sites have been uh, published by the U.S. Navy detailing their sampling and methodology, uh, monitoring methodologies. Uh, the monitoring data confirms that there has been no significant effect to, on the environment. Uh, the nuclear fuel in both submarines remains intact 
And any leaks at this depth would just simply settle out on the barren seabed at 2,600 meters and uh, 3,000 meters, respectively, with no adverse effects to the environment. So, um, whereas an airplane, uh, nuclear powered airplane crashing uh, <clears throat> normally over land uh, could spread uh, its uh, radioactive particulate to the environment, uh, where it could enter into the uh, it, it could enter into the community through uh, various methods like via ing ingestion or inhalation. Um, that is not the same for USS or for su nuclear powered submarines where uh, they sink at extreme depths and uh, their fuel is um, still contained and just a really deep and under immense <laughs> sea pressure, uh, but no, no leaking to the environment. And it's harder to get into the ingestion streams of, of the environment itself. So, um, the, in the Navy, we uh, say that uh, these two submarines are on eternal patrol. Uh, we say that for um, all hands that are lost at sea. So, uh, very, uh, yeah. Prayer for the shipmates. Now, to raise uh, your spirits a little bit, here's a video taken somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. Um, uh, it's likely in the South China Sea uh, on the surface transit into Singapore. Um, what you see before you right now is uh, I'm standing in the bridge and this is the bow of the ship as we're uh, driving forward in the water, just the, the immense power uh, pushing the, the water over the cone of the boat and um, just creating a, a, a substantially large uh, bow wave. Uh, it's pretty amazing to see uh, the turn sideways. I got a, that's my one of my buddies from deployment. Forgot he was in this video. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so I'm stepping over now to so turn to the back of the boat so you can see the uh, the power of the waves from the rear of the ship. And yeah, look at the amazing power of the submarine churning the water behind her. It's just. <clears throat> It's really cool. So it's one of those experiences that like you just, you, I mean, people will stand in line for like hours. They'll wake up in their off time uh, or their sleep time and stand in line just to get five minutes in the bridge. It's one of those experiences that's just, uh, it's really amazing. And it's always the highlight of any underway that you go on. Yeah, pretty powerful. Just seeing her move through the water under nuclear propulsion. Sorry. Uh, so, while nuclear-powered marine propulsion has certainly taken off in the military sector, it never really got out the chance to get off the ground in the civilian market. Uh, most of the cargo ships were merely test platforms, and the icebreakers were exclusively built by the Soviet Union. Uh, that being said, the U.S. aircraft carriers uh, have enjoyed the same freedoms and range offered by nuclear power as the submarines have, and they have become an integral part of the U.S. naval fleet. Uh, pictured on the right there, uh, the white, all white boat is a merchant ship, um, and which we will revisit here in a few slides. But for now, <clears throat> we'll answer this age old question diesel versus nuclear for maritime propulsion. So the HMS Queen Elizabeth is uh, pictured on the left, it is the pride of the English fleet. Um, she has uh, she went, they went in favor of integrated electric propulsion over uh, nuclear power due to high costs and the required manpower. Um, and their propulsion consists of two Rolls-Royce Marine Trent 36 megawatt gas turbine generators and four diesel generator sets. Um, the Trents are, and the diesels are actually the largest ever supplied to the Royal Navy. And together they feed the low voltage electric systems as well as four GE power conversion, uh, 20 megawatt electrical propulsion motors uh, that drive the twin fixed pitch propellers. Uh, on the right here, you see the USS Ford. Uh, the new Bechtel A1B reactor for the Gerald uh, R. Ford class is smaller and simpler and requires less crew, but yet is more powerful than the Nimitz class A4W reactor, which is the previous aircraft carrier class. Uh, the portion of thermal power allotted to the electrical uh, generation system will be tripled, and the ship converts 
steam into power by piping it to four main turbine generators, just as we discussed earlier in the cutaway drawing that we talked about. Uh, and to, that's to generate electricity for uh, major ship systems, the new electromagnetic catapults, which are pretty cool. And yeah, uh, the Gerald R4 class ships use uh, steam turbines for propulsion as well. And if you were to run each type of aircraft carrier with 200,000 horsepower nonstop for one week, a conventional carrier, HMS Queen Elizabeth, like HMS Queen Elizabeth, uh, would require 5 million liters of diesel fuel, while a nuclear carrier, uh, the USS Ford, would require just four kilograms of enriched uranium. In other words, a nuclear carrier consumes as little as 0.00008% of the fuel that conventional carriers do. And there's a simple reason for that. And the clear reason that nuclear marine propulsion and nuclear power in general uh, is so attractive can be best summed up in two words, power density. Uh, the white ship that I pointed out earlier, the Otto Hahn, uh, was fueled, refueled for the first time in, after her four years of operation. So four years from the time she was commissioned, um, served as a merchant ship, uh, and it was refueled for the first time in four years, she had logged over 250,000 nautical miles on 22 kilograms of uranium. And uh, that is, that's, imp that's impressive. Talk about skipping literally every gas station. So one uranium uh, fuel pellet creates as much energy as uh, one ton of coal or 149 gallons of oil or 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas. Uh, one kilogram of coal produces about seven kilowatt hours of energy, which is not even enough to cover the charging losses of a Tesla Model 3. Now, that'll be my hypo hypothetical uh, comparison car that I wish I owned throughout this, uh, this slide. So one kilogram of oil produces about 13 kilowatt hours of energy, which is just enough to cover the charging losses of my hypothetical Tesla. And whereas one kilogram of uranium fuel can charge our, my Tesla Model 3 266,666 times from zero to 100%, and then one last time to 94% with charging losses. And that translates to 119 million miles driven or over 119 million miles driven. Um, and that is what true CO2 free energy looks like. The amount of CO2 that would be released while burning coal to produce the electricity to charge my Tesla for that same number of driven miles uh, or driven kilometers uh, is 7,951 metric tons of CO2. So uh, this is the reality of the plug. As the demand on our grids increase to facilitate the shift to electric vehicles, we will be stuck chasing our own tail if we just are reallocating uh, the CO2 pollution from the muffler to the local coal plant. Um, yeah, which is why nuclear is such a great option. <clears throat> but enough about that, I'll go back to propulsion. So space, the final frontier, and the proverbial land of plenty for nuclear power. To date, there have been over 70 nuclear power systems uh, deployed in space, ranging from satellite rover or satellites to rovers. Pictured here is a uh, radioisotope thermoelectric generator, or RTG, that is basically a nuclear battery. Um, it is a solid container with uh, nuclear fuel inside. Uh, thermal couples are placed in the walls of the container uh, at the outer, at, with the outer end of each thermal couple connected to a heat sink. Uh, the radioactive decay of the fuel produces heat. It is the temperature difference between the fuel and the heat sink that allows the thermal couples to generate electricity. Um, plutonium-238 is the common fuel of choice for RT RTGs as the uh, energy density is kind of like the middle of the road amongst other ca uh, candidate elements. Uh, it doesn't require much shielding and its half-life is 87.7 uh, years, which again is kind of like middle of the road, and, but long enough to be uh, extremely useful. As space exploration continues, the amazing energy density properties over those of chemical fuels is surely to cement uh, nuclear propulsion's future in the energy portfolio of space. While solar panels may work for the International Space Station, uh, the load is relatively small, uh, the ISS is relatively close to the sun, and the solar panels are absolutely massive. Uh, as we get further away from our little blue planet, the sun becomes fainter, uh, thus reducing the solar panel's effectiveness. 
And uh, chemical fuel is also extremely heavy and a, severe, a severely limiting factor in space exploration. Um, one day we will make manned flights to deep space. Uh, the method of propulsion may still be up in the air, but it seems pretty clear that nuclear power will play a role in some form or, or another. Uh, and one of those um, may be in the, in the nuclear thermal rocket. So a nuclear thermal rocket is a type of thermal rocket where uh, the heat from a nuclear reaction, um, nuclear fission, uh, replaces the chemical energy of the propellants in a chemical rocket. Uh, in, an, in an NTR, a working fluid, usually liquid hydrogen, is heated to a high temperature uh, in a nuclear reactor and then expands through a rocket nozzle to create thrust. Uh, the external nuclear heat source theoretically allows a higher um, effective exhaust velocity and is expected to double or triple payload capacity compared to chemical propellants that store energy internally. Uh, as energy positive fusion is still far on the horizon, uh, fossil fissile fuel is likely to continue uh, to play a large role in the development of NTRs. In 2019, the US Congress approved uh, $125 million in development funding for nuclear thermal propulsion rockets. And in 2021, DARPA, uh, if you don't know who they are, Google them, it's pretty interesting, created the internet. Uh, but DARPA selected an, inter an early engine design by General Atomics and two spacecraft concepts from Blue Origin and Lockheed Martin. And uh, proposals for a flight demonstration of nuclear thermal propulsion uh, in the fiscal year of 2026 are due by August 5th of this year. So we might see a nuclear thermal rocket demonstration here, pretty here in the next few years, which would be pretty cool. <clears throat> As I said, fusion is oftentimes uh, one of the main things that people want to talk about, especially when you talk about nuclear power. Uh, there's it's funny. One of my first days in the office, we naturally brought up fusion as it uh, comes up in almost every conversation. And it's funny to know that the same joke told in American universities is told in European universities because uh, one of my fellow colleagues said, yeah, I had a professor say that we're about a hundred years away from um, useful uh, fusion reactions or fusion uh, power, fusion energy, electricity from fusion. And uh, that he said that his professor told him the exact same thing uh, 40 years ago when he was first walking into his class. So it's that ever elusive, yep, in about 100 years, yep, in about 100 years, or still 100 years away, 40 years later, still 100 years away. But uh, it, it is, it, there is a lot of work going on in the field and nuclear and fusion does have, uh, I mean, obviously a lot of um, energy that it can provide. So research is ongoing. But just a basic understanding of how fusion reactor works. Uh, fusion reactions occur when two or more atomic nuclei come close enough for a long enough period that the nuclear force pulling them together exceeds the electrostatic force pushing them apart, uh, fusing them into a heavy nuclei, heavier nuclei. Uh, for nuclei lighter than iron 56, this reaction is exothermic, uh, meaning they release energy and heat uh, when they fuse. Since hydrogen has a single proton in its nucleus, uh, it requires the least amount of effort to attain fusion and yields the most net energy output. Um, <clears throat> so that's why it's like one of the uh, common uh, fuels of choice. Uh, that being said, there are several engineering problems that need to be addressed prior to fusion becoming a energy, the energy source of the future. Uh, other technologies are being considered for nuclear propulsion in space. Uh, each one stronger than the last from iron thrust or sorry, stranger than the last, <clears throat> from ion thrusters powered by onboard nuclear power plants to shooting lasers at sails and even exploding nuclear bombs behind spaceships. That's not a joke. That's actually a serious uh, um, concept. Uh, while engineers continue to tackle the problems of tomorrow, one thing seems for sure, <clears throat> nuclear power has radically changed the way we look at energy and its relative abundance. And it seems that it is here to stay in one form or many. <clears throat> this picture is a, an illustration of the ITAR, ITAR fusion reactor in France that is currently being built. And uh, it's a pretty cool little concept. So if you, there's a lot of reading uh, for fusion reactors out there. So if you uh, <clears throat> are ever bored and kind of a nerd 
like us at Fermi. Uh, there are plenty of plenty of reading material uh, on the internet about the prospects of fusion, and there's even been some milestones made in the past few months, but we are still, again, 100 years away. Um, yeah, so that pretty much, that's actually the end of my presentation. Um, I would like to remind everybody, uh, I would like to encourage people to ask questions if you have them, but just remember that most, I mean, by most, I mean all of the uh, information coming from the nuclear propulsion in space, I had to research myself. <laughs> But uh, if you have any questions about life aboard a submarine or nuclear marine propulsion, uh, fire away. Mm -hmm. Please, uh, if somebody have questions, you can uh, write them in the uh, comment section in Facebook or uh, you can write them in Zoom. I have a question. How fuel, uh, fuel is changed on a nuclear submarine? Um, you know how it's changed in uh, their... Uh, um, traditional reactors or reactors, but how, how it's done in a nuclear submarine? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's pretty much the same. Um, yeah, you just, you got to cut a large hole in the top of the boat. <laughs> That's pretty much the only difference, which, uh, um, you know, hole penetrations are, are made for all kinds of things in, in, uh, in submarines. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's basically the same. They'll, they'll cut a large hole in the top of the ship and then they'll replace the fuel just like they would a uh, normal uh, civilian power plant. Uh, cranes above it, lifting uh, fuel out of the fuel cha uh, channels and whatnot. But um, yeah, it's, it's pretty much the same. And then, and then obviously when they come back later, they drop that piece back, to get, uh, back down on top of the hole where they cut it away from. And you have like a team of welders that come out and weld the, uh, the patch. And uh, they always look at us and say, trust us, the, the weld is normally stronger than the metal, so you're fine. <laughs> so, there's a, it's, always a, it's always fun going underwater that first time after a, after a hole cut. Okay. And it's, it's, uh, it's done in dry dock. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's done in dry dock, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yep. It's, it's, and like I said, it's, uh, it's, I mean, every, pretty much every submarine goes through it. I think every submarine has probably at some point in her life. Uh, and then, um, let's see. Yeah, and then it's, the frequency is a little bit different than uh, civilian power plants because, uh, you know, different enrichment levels and design. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can say that on the nuclear uh, uh, submarines, uh, uh, you use the um, sm small uh, reactors. Yeah, yeah, it'd be uh, comparable to uh, an SMR, uh, mm -hmm. small modular reactor, uh, much like we're looking at at Fermi. Um, mm -hmm. Very. Now, uh, the reactors on, like, obviously, like on an aircraft carrier, uh, the ones that they use are massive in comparison. I, I've never, so I've been on an aircraft carrier before uh, when she was in port. And I got to walk around. I didn't get to go in the engine room because I wasn't part of that uh, crew. But um, it, it there's just the the kind of, the scale of everything is just much much greater. And I, I had I've, I've had several friends uh, throughout my time in the Navy that have been stationed on submarines uh, who have described like the just enormity of the the different pieces. Like their reactor coolant pumps are like impossibly large by my comparison like to anything that i could possibly imagine and that like we're talking like f like two to four story tall pumps and giant pipes like just the, the scale of everything is just vastly bigger um uh, the propulsion plant on a submarine is more akin to yeah like an smr mm -hmm. so. okay okay